we may as well get started or we'll get too far behind. We're going through this in some detail. I'm going to take you through an example. This would be what you'd have to do if you were given the job of finding a line that you wanted to use to measure some species. But in most cases, you're not the first one to do this. You're just trying to say, how did they do this at uh, University X? Why did they pick that transition? Read the paper. They used the line, a particular line. They used it a certain wavelength. Here's the line strength. You you're kind of move on and you use this information. Uh, and you still have to deal with line shape. So usually, this is just for understanding. You wouldn't have to go through this yourself. You would be, probably be following somebody else who'd already done it. But we'll go through one example, and it's in your notes, and that way you'll have access to it if you'd like to, uh, to, to give it more time. And so this is for UV absorption of OH in the X2 pi to A2 sigma band. So these are absorption transitions between X and A. And um, it's at around 300 nanometers in the UV. And we've already learned that, that uh, OH is an X2 pi state. This may look like a bit of a surprise. What are we doing with this A2 sigma? You'll learn that the transitions we care about always have the same multiplicity. They always have the same spin. We have different rules for how lambda can change. A just means that it's the first uh, energy level, energy, uh, electronic energy state up with the same multiplicity too. You go from capital X, capital A, capital B, capital C, so on. Sometimes there's a lower case that's used, like a little a, and that would mean that instead of having a two going to a two, that another number would be there. So that's, those are usually weaker and we don't deal with them. But that's the notation, x, a, b, c, d. Um, but we'll go through this, and this is about as bad as it ever gets for a diatomic molecule. So you end up writing or drawing diagrams like this that show you how the, uh, the, the, allow, the energy level structure. And we're going to look at the energy level structure. Um, you have to look at the energy level structure in both the ground state and in the upper state. I have to move over here a little bit so I can see better. I didn't have to put my other glasses on. So I can see. Let's see if I can see better now. Okay. So. Uh, you've learned that we have to worry about multiple quantum numbers. So this is imagining that we're down here in the lower electronic state where um, N is 13. What are the allowed values of J? J can be either 13 plus a half or 13 minus a half. So there's two values of J. Or I could have plotted this for a given value of j, there's two values of n. That's this uh, splitting that we worry about. Now there's a little c and a little d that corresponds to the lambda doubling that, because lambda can either be forward or backwards. So that means that for a given n and for a given j, there's actually two substates. If we had no lambda doubling, there'd be one here and one over here. That would mean that there'd be two states for each n. But now there's four because of this lambda doubling we're going to take into account. Now, there's also a, little, a beta symbol and a p symbol. p stands for parity. Beta has to do with a certain notation that we use. But you'll notice that beta is a one here and there's a two over here. And you'll notice that this p, which stands for parity, is minus plus plus minus. So, and the reason that's there is that in, ultimately we can only allow transitions that go in a way that we change parity. That's a, a, a fun mechanical issue. So the lines here, the, the energy levels here are all of those associated with N of 13. The, the energy levels up here are those in the A2 pi, uh, sigma state that all represent possibilities. So now we have J ranging from 15, 14, 13, 12, and 11. And you see that J uh, is, um, is um, in the next column over. Excuse me, that's 15. Uh, 15, 14, 13, 
11 and 12, 11. So there's four, five possibilities in N here, you'll see in a minute. Each one of those has a specific value of J. In this case, you'll notice it's always minus a half. Over here, on this side, it's plus a half. So just like down here, we have, for each N, there's two J's. Same thing applies up here, because it's still a two, but we no longer have lambda doubling. So up here, there's only one line. Down here, there's two. Why is there no lambda doubling? Because it's a sigma. Lambda is not, is, is zero. So I've drawn up here the 10 candidate energy level, energy levels that could communicate with these. And then very on, superposed on top of that is a notation that indicates the ones that are possible and their notation. So there's R of two, Q of 2, P of 2. And that's in line with the fact that there's this 2 in this column. Correspondingly over here, there's the 1s. And that's just the shorthand notation that goes along with the fact that this is the, the J is the N plus a half, and this is the J is the N minus a half. So these are the 1s and these are the 2s. Remember, you only have to remember 1. J is N plus is usually the 1 case, and the 2 case. So that's the change, this is splitting between J and N. Now, you take my word for it, because uh, I have to look it up too. Uh, one of these is a, the C state is a minus and the D state is a plus, and vice versa over here. So the two comes about because this is J is N minus a half. The one becomes about because this is J equals N plus a half. These are the lambda doublings. The C is always on top. And, and you can look it up and show that this one has a positive polarity and this one has a, and this one has a minus. Now you go up to the top, and this is a two sigma case. So that's lambda is zero, lambda is zero. So this was analogous to the case I showed for oxygen, where you have the uncoupled S. Now each of these has its own, these are ones, because this is the J is uh, N plus a half. These are twos. And uh, all these arrows, so there's three, six, nine, 12. There's 12 possibilities. Some of these are shown with lighter lines. They're the ones that cross over. They're the ones that have two subscripts. That's because they go, these are one twos. One, two. They're weak. They're possible, but they're weak. They're called satellite bands. The big ones are going to be these strong lines, of which there are six. Why do we have six? Well, for one value of n, there's two values of j. And each one of those can have three, p, q, and r. So that's how we get to six. OK, so you have to study this to see that these are all the possibilities. Now, r means that j has changed by one. So you have to follow the rules that the polarity changes, parity, parity, excuse me, parity changes. You go from a minus here, up here to a plus. What's R mean? Delta J is one. R is always delta J is one. Q is always delta J is zero. P is always delta. So they stay in the two category and there's only one subscript. We only go to two subscripts when they cross, when they cross over. And what you'll find is that these are all the possibilities. And the strong ones are obvious, they're the bold lines. And so it's kind of complicated, but you can kind of, once you draw the diagram, you can exclude all the other possibilities. You can't have delta J of two. You can only have, and, and still call it an R, Q, and a P. All right, so that's kind of what it's all about. And I showed this earlier in the, in the lecture set. This would be a plot of the line strengths versus wavelength for all of the possibilities that I've just shown you. There's a Q1, a Q2. So there are six, two Qs, two Rs, two P, two, six primary branches. And for, you can forget most of the ones that have little, have the uh, double subscripts. So how did we get there? Well, that's what we're gonna go through. So this has to be at a specific temperature because when you change the temperature, you change the Boltzmann distribution. Change the Boltzmann distribution, you change the relative intensities. So you have, this is the zero, zero band. So 
V double prime and V prime are zero. It's 2,000 degrees, and I'm in this system right here. And these are all the lines that are significant with their notation. Well, okay. So there's several steps in this process, and uh, it's in your notes, so I won't, I won't uh, go them, through them in too much detail. You have to decide which lower, upper and lower states you're going to deal with. You have to decide which transitions are allowed. You have to introduce what's, you have to utilize my transition notation. I think I'm going to show you this in a minute. You have to find these oscillator strings, which are mostly just Honda London factors and Frank Condon factors. You've got to calculate the Boltzmann fraction. That turns out to be tricky, but you always have one ace in the hole when you do Boltzmann fractions. The sum of the Boltzmann fractions it has to be one. If you add up your Boltzmann fractions and you're off by a factor of two, you can usually find the problem. So you know something about the Boltzmann fractions, you can help to sort out the problems that you usually have. The line shape function, and then you're done. Now, in most cases, again, uh, some people came in late. In most cases, you're following what somebody else has already done. They use the Q16 transition at such and such a wave number. You're going to do it too. You know the wave number. You set the wavelength of your laser, and you, and, and you just kind of follow in somebody else's footsteps. You use their oscillator strengths. It, it's it's, it's uh, not as hard as this is all made out to be. But if you're given the problem of, is there a stronger line? Hmm. What if I went to another species? Hmm. Well, now, then you have to go through some of this stuff uh, in some detail if someone else hasn't done it already. So we always use term energies. Uh, looks like I've broken my own rule here. Looks like capital E. Usually it's, this is a capital T. We're here we're using N, that should be a V, N, V, and J for our quantum numbers. Here's the electronic energy, vibrational energy, and rotational energy. We usually invoke this Born-Oppenheimer approximation which says that we can, we can separate energy types so that G is in this form and F is written separately. So there's the Born-Oppenheimer approximation and there's the Frank Condon principle. Big, I get confused sometimes. Born-Oppenheimer just says that it's okay if I separate the energy of vibration and rotation and just add them up. Otherwise, I'd have to have an energy that's, that's a mixed function of, of a V and J. You get these numbers out of books. This is, you know, this system's been studied for 100 years. So these numbers are in the book. You go in the book, you look under this. Uh, you have to have the term energy of the upper state. Term energy of the lower state is zero. So the energy spacing is the difference in the, in the potential energy wells, TE, plus the contributions for changes in vibration and rotation. At this level, I've only given you enough to find the band centers. This would be enough to find the, cent, the rotationless transition wave numbers for any VV pair. But we haven't dealt with the rotation yet. Now, we have to pay attention to the upper state. We've been paying attention to the ground state. We've got to pay attention to the upper state. This is just like the oxygen case. Uh, this, the upper state is a uh, two sigma. Sigma means that lambda is zero. There's no lambda. Uh, if there's no lambda, then S gets unlocked and can go, in, go its own way. And we get J by this combination where J can have two values. Since, since we have the two sigma case, J has two values, n plus a half and minus a half. And the, and the point is that these, these states have different energy. So let's look at OH. So upper states two sigma, lambda zero, sigma's not defined, Hunt's case B, n can be n, that's the nuclear part. It could be anything, zero, one, two, three, four, five. But S is a half, therefore J, and J can never be negative. J1, F1 is always the plus case. That's how I remember it. F1 is always J equals N plus a half. Therefore, the other one is J equals N minus a half. Now, different books will do this, write the energy either in terms of N or F. When they'll say, if they say F1 of 10, you know they're talking about N because only N is an integer. J is a half integer. So you can tell right away if they're tabulating in terms of n or j. If this was f1 of 10 and a half, I'd know they're talking in terms of j. Now, 
the upper state. So if it were a pure case B, you could put the equations that I've been showing you in a form like this. Here's the distortion term, pretend it's not there. Here's the distortion term, pretend it's not there. So F1 and F2. The difference between those two is J equals N plus a half and J equals N minus a half. So if I, get, if I tell you N, it's not enough. I've also got to tell you J. What's J in this case? It's N minus a half. So you can write these expressions, and this should be a V, in terms of V, so this is B sub V, N. And so the distortion term, forget about it. So one's a plus and one's a minus. So the splitting here between those states is, 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 the split, is the split constant, one wave numbers in this case. So immediately you have an equation for the states, the energies of the states. You've got to have to have equations for the energies of the lower states, and then you take the allowed differences. So this one's not that bad. This would be the spin splitting. That number is about 0.1. So that just says that for a given, or a given n, j of n plus a half and j of n minus a half is, is uh, split by approximately 0.1 times whatever n is. If n is 10, this is uh, 19, 1.9 wave numbers. So this is a model, but it's a pretty good model. Life gets a little more complicated, unfortunately, for the lower state. And this is mostly associated with the fact that it's a hydride. Molecules are more difficult when one of the atoms is an H. Unfortunately. So now, uh, this is just a plot of the same thing. So this is this two gamma, this is the splitting between, for given n now, j has two values. The first one is called the F1, this is called the F2, and, and it can be shown, or you can look it up, that the parity for both of these is, is a plus. If I went to an n of 1, I'd get these two right here. If I went to n of 0, there's only one state. I can only have the F1 state. Notice how it goes from plus, minus, plus. And in the lower state, it goes the other way around. It goes minus, plus, minus. So that denotes a parity. And, and, and uh, this gets back to this nuclear spin business again. In this case, for, for this type of molecule, even ends, even ends have plus. Just rules. You can look up the rules. This, for this structure, even ends have pluses. Odd ends have minuses. And then you have to have this rule about parity change between. You have to go from a plus to a minus and a minus to a plus. The ground state. Well, here's the ground state. So we have a lambda and a sigma. That's good. That would be Hun's case A. It's like a symmetric top. It looks nice and clean. The trouble is it's a hydride. And therefore, it turns out that when it's at low rotational quantum numbers, it, does, it, it behaves. Unfortunately, when it spins up high, it misbehaves. And so when it starts spinning hard, this S comes unlocked. What does that mean? That means we have some sort of mixed equations. It kind of goes from one value set at low end, and it goes to another set at high end, and they call that an intermediate case. And so, but it's something, it would be in the literature. So unless you're the first person doing OH, you can just find these equations and you use them. So they, now they're starting to look a little more complicated because this has been built for this intermediate case. When it, when it appears like this, here's the F1 of N and the F2 of N, you understand that. The Bs, you understand. The N is the rotational quantum number, you understand that. Lambda is the value of lambda. Everything looks pretty good until you get to a Y. And the Ds, you just kind of, they're not too important. Forget those. Everything's going good until you get to the Y. What's Y? Y is the shorthand notation for A over B. And this is where it gets a little subtle. B sub V is your moment of inertia. A is either the moment of inertia or the spin orbit coupling constant. And Numerically, the absolute magnitude is about the same, but it's a negative number. So Y is a negative number, because A is a negative spin orbit. And that just means that it's inverted, really. There's regular and inverted. So, okay, for small n, it behaves like Hunt's case A, and you'd be able, probably could do this with a little bit of work. Or large n, unfortunately, behaves like Hunt's case B, <laughs> and we have different equations. And in between, it's kind of, kind of varies. 
So let's look at this. Ground state. So what is F1? That's J is the N plus a half. Over here, J is N minus a half. And it looks like these things are maybe missing from your diagram here, unfortunately. Is it from my screen? I don't think it's missing from my screen. Okay, I'll have to tell you then. This is the three halves, five halves, seven halves. So the question is, subtle question, this is the three halves. N is one, this is an F2, this is an F1, which one is higher? Well, because A is negative, that's why the three halves is lower than the one half. So if you know the sign of A, you're already done. But that's why this is the three halves and this is the one half. So there's some subtleties in this, except if you find the paper in which all these energy levels are given, you know, they're tabulations. They're already done. And that's about 130. So if we had gone back to this model equation here, T is T0 plus A lambda sigma, and if you looked in the tables and it said, well, A for A, A is about a minus 140, then this should have been 140. But when you actually measure them from spectroscopy, you get 130. Why is that? Because already as you're going up this ladder, it's starting to change its behavior. So that's why. That's why it's not exactly 140. Now for Hunt's case B, this should be, remember this is a three halves and five halves. So this is a three halves and a three halves. Three halves, three halves. According to the Hunt's case, this ought to be two times the value of A minus BV. So anyway, you can work this all out. And um, what does it say here? Constant offset for Hunt's case A should be lower by 316, but it's only 188. And that's because it's already as a hydride already starting to change its character. It's in between. Lambda doubling. So we have to add another, every place there was one line, there's now two, but they have different parity. And so you don't double the number of lines that are present, you just have to be careful about where they're coming from. So now this is where we go to this, this, this picture. Okay, now I'm introducing one more nomenclature. Term symbol here. Frequently there will be a parenthesis that indicates the vibrational quantum. So what is this? That's the vibrational quantum number for the transition we're worried about, for the band we're worried about in the A2 sigma state. Now the transitions that are, are characterized by this additional notation, Y, X, A, B. Let's look at A and B. A has to do, it, this has to do with the I that's in F sub I. Remember we have F1 and F2? So this is a one and this is a two. And so we call that an, an alpha of one. So it's a one. Whereas beta would be for a two. So that's, that's the notation. So anyway, this notation can be used, a little compact notation that allows the expert to figure in exactly what transition is this. When, when, um, when this y, which is delta n, when that delta n equals delta j, you don't see a y. You just see e, q, r here. So that's why we saw like q, q1 or q2 or q12. So when alpha equals beta, that is when the one equals the one, or the two equals the two, you only see one symbol here. That's why you saw q1 and you saw q2. But if you looked, you would also have seen a Q12, and that's when it crosses over, and it's usually, usually weak. So there's a lot of rules. This is interesting. So in this situation, I told you wrong. It is possible for delta N to be 2 when delta J is 1. They're weak. Okay, big rule. Parity must change. Delta J has to be 0 plus minus 1. Those are inviolate rules. You can't have a 0 to 0. There's certain hard rules that come into play. So you put all those rules together and you get back to this diagram that I showed you. This contains all of the allowed transitions. So you should look at this if you want. 
and say, do I understand why there's not a line in a certain place? Do I understand why there is a line in a certain place? Cross branches weaken. So basically, when n gets bigger, these cross branches go away. Why do I have two figures here? Let's see. This is for a 13. I've lost track of why I'm doing this here. Uh, it's, I don't know. I really lost track of what I was supposed to say on this particular slide. OK. Oh, I guess I was going to make the point. Um, in this case, you see, because the upper state is a sigma, lambda is not is, is zero, there's no lambda doubling. The situation would have been a lot worse if these lines had been lambda double. If we'd have been in a simpler system like two sigma, two sigma, all of a sudden it looks really simple again. You, and these are weak, so there's really just two transitions, P and R, P and R, and P and R. So from this, these term symbols, immediately you know where they're in for trouble. Immediately you know how simple is it going to be or how hard it's going to be. Then you look and you find it in Hertzberg or somewhere. They've already worked all this out. So here's my working example. Um, you, need, you need oscillator strengths, and you need Boltzmann fractions, and you need a line shape function. Those are the elements. What are some things we know? Well, we have to keep track of our equation of this uh, equation of state here, P equals NKT, ideal gas. Uh, we're going to get, here's our Boltzmann fraction here. So the number of species I, species I now is OH. This is the number density of OH times the Boltzmann fraction in that state. So here's our absorption coefficient that we're after. The fractional transmission is given by e to the minus k nu L. I need k nu. A constant, the number density in the absorbing state, number per cubic centimeter, oscillator strength for the transition I'm looking at, Induced emission term that's almost always one in the line shape function. All the, all the work is right here. Once you've decided which line you're going to look at and you've found its wavelength, all the work is right here. What is the Boltzmann fraction and what is the oscillator strength? That's what we have to do. So we're going to do step, that's step four. I guess we're going to do, we're going to do the absorption coefficient of the oscillator strength first, I guess. Okay. So if I really were going to be complete, I would write out the oscillator strength in terms of all of the parameters. Electronic, vibrational, spin, angular momentum, time to doubling, those are the things I have to worry about if they're there. But in the end, it's given by the product of three terms. The electronic strength, the frank condon factor, and the honnold london factor. These are numbers. This one comes from from uh, quantum mechanical calculations, but they're tabulated. This one comes from observations mostly, but these are, this is a fraction. See, the most this can be is a half, basically. Uh, this is a number, and this is a number. They come from different <coughs> kinds of experiments. Now, if you're going to do OH, you'd look it up and you'd say, well, I'm going to be using the zero, zero band at 306 nanometers. The oscillator strength is known to be 0 0.00096 within about 2 or 3%. It's known. It's done. So if you decide you're going to look at <clears throat> that band, a line in that band, the oscillator strength is already known for the band. <clears throat> and where that came from was uh, an, an electronic oscillator strength and a Frank Condon factor, defined in a way that they're all sum up to 1. Uh, this one's, but the honnold linden factor is a little bit trickier. And uh, it's, it's, you'd like to think that it sums up to 1, but it turns out that it has to sum up to 2j plus 1 because it's divided by 2j plus 1. And if it weren't for this thing right here, the sum of these honnold linden factors divided by 2j plus 1 would just be 1. But there's this little complication here about the lambda doubling and the spin splitting. So this has to do, way, to do with the way they're tabulated. So if you look these up and you add them all up, you'll end up with 4 times 2j plus 1. That's okay. You just 
you have to keep track of this. They're tabulated in this value. If you want to divide by four, you can. Now what is this? This is the sum. This is the sum uh, for all of the states with a given j. So if you're in a j, j double prime, how many values of n can you have? Two. How many values of lambda double can you have? Two. So the sum of your Hanel Linden factors has to be four times the value for an individual transition. So the Hanel Linden factor is for an individual transition. You just have to be careful how they're normalized to add up properly. Now, there's some, some subtleties here of telling the Georgia Tech students that when I get confused about this, I call my ex-student Jerry Seitz. He helps me remember how he did this years ago. And it all has to do with, there's some subtleties here. It is the Hanel London factor for J double prime to J prime the same as the inverse? Is the Hanel London factor for going up the same as coming down when one's a two pi state and one's a two sigma state? So, very subtle. But it all really boils down to everything has to add up to one. If it doesn't add up to one, you got trouble. So uh, when, in m many cases this is simple, but it just turns out to be especially nasty for uh, OH. This is in my notes. I'm not going to go through. When is there a problem? So I'm telling you when there's a problem. And uh, all right, oscillator strengths. How well are they known? They come from experiments. It was first me measured back around 1938, to my knowledge. Uh, this guy seemed to get it wrong. This is F00. Marshall Lafayette is a friend of mine. You got it right. Uh, there's no. Let's see, the latest one is the 73. So it kind of homed in at 0 0.00096. I would say it's known to about 2%. How is it measured? Well, you could populate a, a OH molecule and watch the decay rate in the absence of collisions. That would be the Einstein, that'd give you the Einstein A coefficient. The decay time would give you the A coefficient. No, you have to look at only the lines between 0 and 0. So if you're a molecule in, in um, V prime equals zero in some specific J, and you look at all the, all the uh, emission down to V double prime of zero, that gives you the oscillator strength. So it's done experimentally. These are all experimental. But it gives you a sense of how well it's known. It's known to a couple percent, I would say. And now, you could, now we're gonna use this number to get the absorption. Therefore, I could have also done an absorption experiment. But you tell me exactly how much OH I have. Pressure, temperature, I know how to do the Boltzmann fraction. If I measure the absorption, I've determined K nu. If I look at the integrator over the line shape, I get the oscillator strength. You can do it that way too. Just a question of what's best. It's hard to produce a known amount of OH. That's the problem. If you put in a known amount of OH, I can measure the absorption and get uh, F00. But it's hard to produce a known amount of OH. So typically people will excite it somehow and they'll watch the decay in the absence of collisions. You can measure the relaxation time pretty accurately. And that's usually how it's done. Well, so all this stuff is tabulated. I think it's in my, in my notes. I'm sorry for this right here. So the transition, the Honda London factor already divided by 2j plus 1, all these numbers. So if you force yourself to go through this table, you'll, make sure you'll understand all these factors of 2 and 4 and see how it adds up. Boltzmann fractions must add to 1. The molecules have to be somewhere and they can't be in two places. So if you look at your expression for Boltzmann fractions and say, now I'm going to sum up over all the states, you better get 1. If you get two, you've miscounted by, you know, got a factor of two floating around. Okay, now we're going to do the Boltzmann fraction. What do we want to know? Um, okay. Um, let's see what else I've got on here before I do this. Okay. Um, Here's our general expression. Oh, but now we got electronic vibration rotation. Oh, we got to be a little careful here. Where are we putting all these thin splittings? Where are we putting this lambda doubling? 
Are we putting it in the electronic mode or are we putting it in the rotational mode? This is where it gets a little sticky. You can only put it one place. If we put it in the electronic, that's when you, multi you get this multiplier of, um, for lambda doubling and for 2s plus 1. That's where you pick up the factor of 4. Alternatively, you can put it in with the rotational distribution, but it's usually done right here. So this says that the electronic degeneracy in this case is 4 for the ground state and 2 for the upper state. So remember, for a given value of n, I have two values of j. For each one of those, I have a c and a d. So this, this is why I get, for one n, I get 4. Therefore, the sum of these uh, Honolulu factors for a given j double prime over all possible s has to go to this number. This is a state. I don't know if I should call it a state or a level. This is a state for which the residual degeneracy is 2j plus 1. All right, I want to do the electro, I'm going to divide this up and do this uh, notation. So the fraction in n, the fraction in n, just the electronic level now, is given by this expression. So this is the electronic. And I put the electronic up here, so this is the fraction in, in um, what's QE? Now QE is, is going to be, um, be like 4 here. So this, that's the QE. Here's the, here's the 2s plus 1, that's 4 right there. So it's down here as well as up here. I don't know if I go to the next slide, it might be easy. So I got to do the vibration. This is the easy one. What's the fractional population in V? That's e to the minus h over kt times g over q. So that one, this is the easy one. Rotational, this one isn't bad because I've put the hard part into the electronic. So now instead of having 2j plus 1, I get 2n plus 1. That's a subtlety. Q rote is now t over theta r. There's no 2 here because it's asymmetric. So the rotations and the vibrations look like you're expecting. That's because we've done the spin splitting in the electronic. Now I've got to start putting this stuff together. What fraction of those with a given n are in a given j? So in other words, for a given n, what fraction is in j? You go through this and it's in the reader, you'll get about a half. That's what you expect. So about half, why? Because for every n there's two j's, roughly half in each place. That's how you check yourself to make sure that they're going to add up properly. I've forgotten why I put the fee in there. Oh, okay. So that's back to the previous slide where I have to worry about the, the uh, lambda doubling. So you combine all of these things to get the fraction in the state. The state is the thing from which the absorption is going to take place. When you put it all together, you get uh, a, a reasonable expression. The fraction in a given state is one-fourth of that which you would have gotten for a rigid rotor. Why is it four? Because there's lambda doubling times spin splitting. So you have to keep checking yourself to make sure that you haven't left out a factor of two or four. Okay, now there's one more complication. I'll get through with this quickly. With lasers, we do mostly narrowband absorption. That means we use Beer's law, which applies only for a, for a monochromatic source. We've been talking about this. So if we did an experiment like this and we measured the transmission, and I knew this number and this number, and I knew the temperature, I can solve for this. And then from that, I could solve for the total number density if I knew the temperature, the Boltzmann fraction. So if I measure this, and if the length, the pressure, what is that? That's probably the broadening. The temperature and the oscillator shrink, I can solve for the number density. Usually you're after the number density. But sometimes people used to use broadband sources like a flash lamp or a, or a, a conventional light source. It's not monochromatic and Beer's Law doesn't hold. So I just want to let you know that in the old days there was a big problem. And uh, you have to take into account the finite width of your light source and the finite width of the line. If the light source has radiation that's outside of the region that's absorbed, it goes through your experiment and you just see that light. So obviously it doesn't follow Beer's Law. So that's what this last slide is about. It, it tells you that there was something still in some books called the curve of growth. 
And the curve of growth was what we calculated and it's what people would use to convert fractional absorption to number density or to species concentration. All very laborious. These A's here are probably the Voigt parameters. Okay, I'll give you quickly one example it's in your reader. This is the common line. So if I wanted to measure the absorption in this 0, 0 Q1 line in this system, it's at 309.6, 2,000 degrees. This is the collision broadening. I'm going to uh, I'm going to solve for I'm going to solve for what we want. Let's put this all in. I go into the tables for this transition. It's the oscillator strength of 0 0.00096. I look at the Hahn London factors, which is 0.947, comes right out of my table. That's the oscillator strength. Line shape function, we did that, we did that using what we from yesterday. So given the temperature and the pressure and the broadening factors, I know the line shape function at line center. I know phi, that's right there. I know the oscillator strength, that's right there. I make a measurement and I solve right away. Okay, this is the partial pressure of the absorber and then this is just using P equals NKT. Let's see what happens on the next slide here, okay. So here's the population fraction that I have to evaluate with my complications. Now, it looks complicated that I've, I've kept it simple, really. Here's the electronic, the vibrational, the rotational. This is one-fourth. The electronic population fraction is essentially always one-fourth because there's four, four states. So it's, it makes sense. Here's my, the, the vibrational and the rotational ones you can deal with. I go through this and I find out that at this, at this, uh, at this temperature, there's 1.9% of the molecules in this state. So if I've measured the number density in the absorbing state, I can now convert this to the total number density. That's what you do. So you go ahead and you convert this, or you can plot it as an absorption coefficient, Beer's law. I get 59% absorption for 1,000 ppm. This is why, you, this is why we like this. Path length of five centimeters, 1,000 ppm, 2,000 degrees, one atmosphere, I get 59% absorption in this little teeny path length. That means it's easy to do. It's easy to make an absorption measurement line center at these high temperatures. It's an easy way to quantitatively measure OH. So it's worth the effort. But it, it's much easier to follow in somebody else's footsteps than it is to do it for yourself the first time. Okay, I'm gonna let you go, I'm three minutes over. We're going to finish up on something that's more, kind of more contemporary, diode laser absorption. We'll talk about that. Probably won't take more than 50 minutes. Can we, am I ahead of schedule? I am ahead of schedule. Okay, so we can have some questions. I guess if we quit by 4.15, we're all right. Yeah, okay, sorry. I got, I'm off by 15 minutes. I know this is a lot of stuff, but the point is you've now seen it. This is bad as it gets, bad as it gets. And if you're just trying to figure out how, what did they mean in their paper, you can figure it out. It's hard to do it yourself the first time without making a mistake of a factor of two or four. Question. I just want to know what, what if you don't know the temperature? Okay, then maybe you use your absorption to measure the temperature. Oh, the question is, what do you do if you don't know the temperature? Okay, two situations. You do know the temperature, you don't. If you know it, you can invoke, you can calculate the Boltzmann fraction and convert your measurement of absorption in a given state to the total number density of the species, which is usually what you're after. Temperature is not known, you have two choices. You take the ratio of the absorption in two states and use that to get the temperature. And then with the temperature, you use either absorption measurement to get the total number density of the species. So, depends. Usually you have to know pressure also. So you either know the temperature or you have to find it. Or you can pick a line that's temperature insensitive. You can ask from the Boltzmann fraction, what state, over some temperature range, what state has a nearly constant Boltzmann fraction? Then you can use that one. Then you don't have to know the temperature so well. You have to decide whether it's you know it or don't. And uh, if it's, say, a little bit non-uniform along your line of sight, you try to pick a state that's uh, kind of got a constant Boltzmann fraction. Typically, at combustion conditions, that's like N of seven or eight. Can you find the line strength at different temperatures using a formula that you showed uh, yesterday? 
So uh, can you do the same for oscillator strings? OK, the question is, uh, can, can, yeah. question being, I, I think, um, can you do the same for the oscillator string? Really, the, the point is, the oscillator strength is just a number. The line strength is the complicated one because it has units. The oscillator strength for like F00, for OE, it, it's just a number. It's already known. It's just, it's, so that's nice. Uh, but in, in principle, you can go between oscillator strength, A coefficient, line strength. Only trouble is the line strength now is a function of temperature. So you have to be a little careful. Um, but now, if you're an infrared person, all the stuff's in high trend, except it's in there at one temperature. You've got to shift the temperature. It's, it's this UV electronic stuff that's a lot trickier. I don't know if I answered your question very well. Any other questions? Yes? Um, previously, how many different lines of voyage have been used? Um, good question. How many different lines of OH have been used? Usually you're in a situation where you want to get large absorption. So you'll pick something that's near the top of the distribution. So you might have remembered that in this, in OH, the strongest branch is the Q branch. So you would look into the diagram that I just showed you and said, I'm using Q7 or Q8 or Q9 if my laser works there. So usually you want the strongest one. Sometimes you want to pick the one that doesn't change with temperature. But sometimes you have too much absorption. So the nice thing about this is, if your laser is versatile, I just switch to a weaker one. But usually you want more, so usually you pick a strong one. Or you pick one that's uh, free of interference from the others. Sometimes they start overlapping and it gets a little messy. But uh, for the most part, you look and you say, well, this kind of molecule, the Q branch is stronger than the P and the R. I'm going to go near the peak of the Q. It's at 307 nanometers. My laser works there. I learned from this paper that I want to be at 307.6. I tune my laser to there, put the flame in front, make sure that it's at the center of the line, and you just use that one, usually. Sometimes you want to intentionally use a weaker one, or you intentionally, will you, if you want temperature, you do two. You pick one that's maybe insensitive to temperature and one that's very sensitive, pick the ratio. Then it's independent of the amount of the species. So there's different strategies. But usually you want the strongest one. Strongest one within the range of your laser. Other questions? Yes? Could you comment on the uh, accuracy and sensitivity of the OH measurement? Yes. Or are we, uh, so, late, yes. So I'm talking, the question is, can I comment on the accuracy of the OH measure? I'm talking about absorption. You could have done this in emission. Ultimately, you're limited by your knowledge of the, of the there's the error and uncertainty in your measurement, but you're limited by the knowledge base of the oscillator strength. If it's a, and it's a line of sight method, so you have to be careful that it's uniform. But if it's uniform, and uh, you're limited always by the accuracy of the oscillator strength, which I told you is about 2% maybe for OH, and the accuracy with which you make your measurement, let's just say you measure the fractional transmission accurately. So it's hard to do better than, say, 2 or 3%. You can do worse, but it's hard to do better than that. Sometimes you do a relative measurement. Maybe you do, uh, you just want to know how it's changed over time and that you can do a little bit better. But remember, I'm going to tell you on uh, uh, Friday, fluorescence is absorption followed by emission. Almost everything I'm telling you is used immediately in fluorescence. This is not just absorption. This is absorption, this is emission, and it's the subset of what you need for fluorescence. The difference is that in absorption, we almost always use a monochromatic source. We can, and that means we have to understand the line shape. With a pulse experiment like fluorescence, you're using a broad laser. You have to be really careful now about the convolution between the shape of the laser line and the absorption line. It's a subtlety. But if everything's clean, like our laser absorption experiments of OH, we claim we're measuring this to uh, shoot. We're usually limited by the knowledge of temperature. We usually think we're measuring OH to within 3 to 5%. We're really careful. So in our, if you're using a C, what's the sensitivity of the measurement? If you're doing line of sight absorption with a CW laser, 
quiet laser. We, in a shock tube experiment, we think we do this, the limit is usually about 0.1% of absorption. We get, even if the laser is perfectly quiet, we get a little bit of noise when it passes through our shock tube. So we, you can usually set the limit by what's your minimum detectable percent absorption. It's about 0.1%. So if we have, say, 10% absorption, 100 to 1. We, get, we can detect down to 15 parts per million quite routinely with SNR of maybe 20, 30. Detection limits of uh, sub-PPM for OH. For CN, it's even for, uh, for an atom like sodium or a molecule like CN, we can detect parts per billion in our experiment. Of course, if you want to go in the atmosphere, I mean, you can, you can, you can measure. It's kind of a part per million meter. Depends on the length. So, you know, if I double the length, I can measure half of the PPM. So I think of it as the minimum detectable absorption for us is usually 0.1%. Any other questions? Yes. If you're doing fluorescence, OH fluorescence, um, is, is the emission wavelength any different? Uh -huh, good question. Is the emission wavelength in fluorescence different? One of the virtues of fluorescence is that the emission wavelength is usually shifted. It has to be, because <coughs> otherwise you get scattered light at your illumination frequency and it can temp. Your detector can't tell the difference. It can't tell whether the photon is at one wavelength or a little bit different. So you have to shift the emission, and then you have to block the laser light somehow, maybe with a filter. Why? Because the fluorescence signal is a very small fraction of the illumination signal. So that's another challenge. But, but you win a lot by the fact that the fluorescence uh, spectrum is shifted. So you, excite, you excite, and then later you look at the emission. So typically in OH, for example, we might excite from zero to zero and detect zero to one. And some of it goes to zero to one, some goes to zero to zero, but by the Frank Condon factor we know. So you have to shift the fluorescence to avoid this problem. And it gets harder and harder if it's a confined chamber like an engine or a shock. Those are like practical problems. Yes? How do you quantify the absorption of the emission? How do I quantify it? I'm not sure I understand the question. The question was, how do I quantify the absorption or fluorescence? Do you mean on the, do I, how do I quantify the fluorescence? Or how do I quantify the absorption? Well, when it fluoresces the signal, okay. the Well, so I still don't get the question, I guess. We quant for absorption, we just use Beer's law, I over I zero. So we measure I zero, let it absorb, we measure I. And we'll typically have a, we'll split the beam and we measure I0 in real time and we measure I. So we measure I over I0. That's, that's quantitative, self-calibrating. Fluorescence is harder. Fluorescence light comes out. You can, it's spatially quantitative because we get, an Im, say, an image if we do PLF. Spatially quantitative is temporally quantitative. We do it in 2,100 nanoseconds. But to get the concentration of the species is very tricky. That's, and we're going to talk about that on Friday. I don't know if that answers your question, but fluorescence is hard to, quanti to be quantitative. You can be quantitative spatially, temporally, but to get the concentration, that's tricky. And that's why absorption is so nice. My title, my talk is quantitative diagnostic. Absorption is quantitative. Most of the other methods are not so easily quantitative. That's a problem. Any last question? Okay, I guess we'll take a break for 15 minutes.